All right. Good evening, everyone, or whatever time of the day it is, in whatever time zone you're in. This is week two of my uh, weekly blog, Continued. I've sort of been posting in sort of separate sections. I posted to the Jackson Wang video, and today I'm going to talk a bit about um, the French Open tennis match. But in the future, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have sort of separate clips for different themes throughout the week. And then I'll probably have a full video that sh sort of shows um, all the look, all the clips combined together um, together in one week. But uh, for today's video, I'm going to be talking about the semifinal between Djokovic versus Nadal, where Djokovic actually beat Nadal again at the French Open today. So in fact, he is the only man to beat him twice at Roland Garros. That is absolutely insane. So just to give a bit of context, since Nadal's first French Open in 2005, he has played 108 matches in Roland Garros, he's won 13 French Open titles, and he's lost a whopping three matches, two of them to Djokovic. So basically, after four straight titles from 2005 to 2008, in 2009, he loses in the fourth round to Robin, uh, Robin Sutterling. I was watching that match, and he was literally just blown off the court because he had like a once-in-a-lifetime performance. So Sutterling has a really powerful and really flat forehand. So he really managed to play a match where he just like literally overpowered Nadal's defense, and he, and he made like a lot of his shots unreturnable. And that was also the year that uh, Federer finally managed to achieve his career Grand Slam. And for those of you who um, don't know what the career Grand Slam means, it means winning all four major tournaments, which are the most prestigious tournaments in tennis. And he had all of the other three, U.S. Open, Wimbledon, and Australia Open. Uh, he just didn't have the French Open. So that was the year where he actually achieved his career Grand Slam. You may ask, why did it take him so long to actually achieve it? Well, let's see. In 2005, Federer lost in the semifinal against Nadal. In 2006, he lost in the final against Nadal. In 2007, he lost in the final also against Nadal. And in, 2007, in 2008, he lost in the final against Nadal, where he actually got bageled in the final set, which means you lose the set 6-0. So without Nadal, we could actually be talking about Federer being one of the best clay court players ever. He would be winning like four or five French Opens, and that would probably make him like one of the best clay court players of all time. So that's how crazy it was for Nadal to lose to Soderling in 2009. Now, he would follow that up by not, uh, not losing Nadal for another six years. And this time, he lost in the semifinal against Novak Djokovic, which is who we're talking about today. But even then, um, what I remember was that Nadal was coming back from a really long-term injury. So he wasn't really playing his best at the time. So I really think that like even that loss, um, it's really tough for him to lose in, in sort of any Roland Garros match. But that loss against Djokovic, against Sutherland, those are the only two losses he had until today, where six years later in 2021, he finally, finally loses again. So who do you think is the toughest player you've ever faced in your career? Rafael Nadal. Rafael Nadal on clay. That's almost a mission impossible for most of us. No matter how good you feel that day, it's, it's not easy, I promise you that. There you go. I mean, those are top 10 players at the time, including Andy Murray, who was part of the big four. And all of them said that Rafael Nadal was the toughest player they played against, and especially on clay. It's pretty much a mission impossible. Um, I also remember vividly that uh, in 2011, uh, Djokovic was on this 41 match winning streak and he had won just won the Australian Open. And that also happened to be the year where he won three Grand Slam titles, the Australian Open, the US Open and Wimbledon. And Federer actually beat Djokovic in four tight sets um, in the semifinal. And I was like, wow, this is um, the best I've seen Federer play in the French Open. It is a nice. And again, the single digit. Look at that. Six, six. Two gladiators have given us the match of the tournament. There were some crazy awesome rallies here. Like, I'll just pull up maybe one of them. Okay. <laughs> Oh my goodness. This was also before Federer changed his racket to a bigger racket head, so he was still using that tiny wand of his to um play in uh in, in Roland Garros. Um I think in like twenty thirteen he like changed to a bigger racket head. But 
Um, yeah, after that, I was super optimistic about the final, and the final was obviously against Rafael Nadal, only for him to get wrecked in four sets by Nadal. One thing that really sucked about that match is I remember that he was up 5-3 in the first set and then lost the first set 7-5. That was that was pretty crushing. And I have another video clip right here. Um, the first set is clearly a bigger one for him to win than it is for Nadal. See, that is just, okay, that break point right there, that is just inhuman. Federer played maybe like four winners there, and Nadal still managed to get it back. So pretty much, it doesn't matter how good you're feeling, it's almost impossible. His defense, Nadal's defense is pretty much impenetrable. Basically, like any type of like um, shot, unless it's like an absolute winner, Nadal can get back, um, and he can loop it with extreme topspin, which makes it really difficult for you to sort of um, recover and hit like a better shot. So, um yeah, that was that was a pretty crushing crushing final because I thought Federer would actually would actually win that one, but um, once again that reiterates how tough it is to beat an adult even if you are feeling at your best. Um, and prior to this semifinal in the quarterfinal against Diego Schwartzman, uh, Nadal up to that point had won thirty five straight sets in the French Open, and that is of course a record. And um, Diego is really tough. I remember him taking Nadal to four sets a couple years ago prior as well. Um, and I guess basically what I'm saying is, is that even if you can take one set off of Nadal in the French Open, that's pretty much an achievement right there. Like Federer has taken a set off of him. Some other players have taken a set off of him. Um, for the most part, Nadal is not even going to let you take a set off of him in the French Open. But um, I just want to reiterate and just be clear that Nadal still has been Djokovic more. He beat him in last year's final. I'm not saying that Djokovic is a better player on clay than Nadal. But I just want to talk about some of the reasons why I think Djokovic actually managed to win a match, um, let alone two in Roland Garros against, against Nadal. And I think there's sort of three main reasons that I saw from this particular match. The first reason is, again, his flat forehand. And I think this has always troubled Nadal because Nadal could always use his looping forehands to get himself out of trouble. But what Djokovic does is that he likes to take the ball super early and he likes to take the ball on the rise. And generally, most players don't really like it when the ball goes super, super high, like above their like um, above their shoulders. But Djokovic is okay with that, and he actually, um, from forehand, from the forehand set, actually continues to try and push him back and try and go for winners from from those um, high looping forehands. And um, generally speaking, it doesn't matter how good your previous shot is. Nadal can play that defensive shot anytime he wants, but against Djokovic, it's a lot more difficult. So that's one reason. The second reason is I think his movement on the backhand side is just so, so unique. Like, if you look at the way he slides on clay, he's actually sliding um, left foot first. Generally speaking, when you're stretching for your backhand, you're going to go towards your left because you're stretching with, with, your, um, with your right arm to get to that shot, right? But Djokovic doesn't actually do that. When Djokovic is sliding, he slides left foot first. And the advantage, the advantage to that is that when you step with your right a right foot, basically your back is towards the net and you have to sort of twist around and try and accelerate again in the opposite direction to get to the next ball. But because um, Djokovic is sliding left foot first, you can use that left foot as sort of um, a, a pivot foot for him to sort of accelerate again. And that's sort of like a spring for him to like keep going and get to that next shot. So his movement on the backhand side is so, so unique. And I don't think there's any player that actually does that slide to... Um, to the left left foot it's just extremely extremely difficult and it takes like uh tremendous flexibility and the fact that he can do that make makes his like movement a lot more dynamic and allows his recovery to be a lot more dynamic as well on that side in addition to that i think he's actually added a new shot to his ar arsenal in the past couple of years in the backhand so novak's backhand has traditionally always been really really good but he's added this new um backhand where it's become super, super consistent, where he hits the backhand down the line, and it's super, super flat and extremely, extremely difficult to return. Um, I actually remember in the fi final tiebreak against Federer in that um, 2019 Wimbledon final, Federer actually got killed by that shot numerous times, even in the tiebreak when it was like 5-3. He, um, he had um, this shot where... Uh, it was, it was a good rally, but then Djokovic went for the backhand winner, and I can sort of show that right here in this video. Yeah, there you go. 
Okay, let me play it back in 1x speed. I just... Yeah, that backhand down the line. And he's been using it quite effectively in this year's French Open as well. So that's become a really, really consistent shot for him. And um, yeah, just watching that final again, boy, it's just so traumatizing, especially if you're a Federer fan. For those of you who don't know, Federer lost three tie breaks in that final, including the final tie break in the final set. And they had made the new rule where they couldn't, once you get to like um, 12 games apiece, you go to a tie break, which is the first year they enacted that. And basically, um, Federer was actually up a break in the final set, and he had two match points on his serve, and he was unable to close it out. So a pretty traumatizing final if you're a Federer fan. But hats off to Novak and um, his continued improvement on his backhand side, which I didn't even think was, was, was possible because of how good his backhand was already was. So I think those are sort of the three main reasons I would pinpoint in terms of his improvement that he's um, in his in Roland Garros, or maybe just the advantages that he has when he plays against Nadal that other players don't really have. Some other notes that I have on the match is that Djokovic is the only person I know who changes the color of his shirt during the match. This actually happened during the Australian Open final as well. I don't know if this is like some superstition or something that he does to like sort of try and change the flow of the match. It's a little bit weird because in most sports, usually you have like a designated color, like in team sports and stuff like that, and you don't really change it during the game. So um, the fact that he changes his shirt, I think he's the only person that does that. So it's kind of interesting. There's also this like hilarious picture of Sky Sports when Novak Djokovic won the game of just like them, like with like the most like dramatic action shots like like unattractive action shots um i don't know why they included it on there but it's just pretty funny that like it's just pretty funny that that's the shot that sky sports decided to use in addition to that um the match point from the baseline is one of my favorite angles i don't really like the angle so i don't really like the angle from the TV perspective because you can't really see the height of the ball and you can't really see um, how fast or how much spin they're using. But in this particular angle, even though it's like not the best angle because it's from the side, you can sort of see from match point sort of how much power and how accurately they're hitting the ball. That's match point. Finally, uh, Diego Schwartzman's tweet was super funny as well. Um, translated, he says, do we tennis players play the same sport as these two? Um, yeah, basically, they're just next level. And obviously, we have to include Federer in that as well, even though he's um, obviously getting up there in age. But the three of them, the quality of tennis that they have is just unparalleled. And um, if you watch the fi- highlights of the first final today of Sessipas and Zverev, uh, versus the second final of Nadal and Djokovic. It's just, just crazy different, the quality of tennis. That's not like sort of um, trying to go against sort of the new, new generation of players. It's just that the reality currently is, is that the big four, in particular the big three of Federer, Djokovic, and Nadal, have just dominated in the past two decades. And it's been really, really difficult for any of the other players to break through. So um, the this final is a is a good opportunity for Sessi Pass, and we'll we'll see how he does. But just judging from the quality of the two semifinals, it seems like there's still quite a bit of room of, for improvement for all of the new new generation players. By the way, going to like ATP and Roland Garros for the highlights on YouTube, it's not very good, and they've been really stringent on other people posting the highlights. Um, they've been just sort of like cracking down on it and banning it. And it takes so long for the highlights to come up, and the highlight inevitably inevitably just ends up being like three minutes, six minutes. In this case, it was extended highlights for six minutes. We want like over 10 minutes extended highlights, so I really hope that in the future they do something about that. And just to note, if any of my video versions um, from this blog get taken down, it's probably because it got striked by copyright. So 
is keeping that in mind. But anyhow, um, I want to just look ahead, I guess, to the final in the weekend. I guess I don't really have much to say, but obviously I'm, I'm betting on Djokovic to sort of win this match as much as I like Stefanos. For those of you who don't know him, I, I guess I can give everyone sort of a quick background. Sissi Pass actually has his own YouTube channel, which he started around the same time after winning against Federer in the quarterfinal of the Australian Open. And that was when Federer had just won, I think, two years straight prior. So I guess not a bad time to start a YouTube channel. And his style of play is actually... He, he's one of the only players currently, well, I mean theme as well, but there's there's a couple of players now who use a one-handed backhand. The majority of players today use a two-handed backhand just because of its consistency, but Ceci Pass actually does use a one-handed backhand, which is why people are always saying, making comparisons between him and Federer. But one thing I will say, judging from his match in the semifinal, is that I think his backhand shot is too high and too slow. And even though that Zverev didn't really attack that backhand as much, Novak is going to go crazy on that backhand, uh, either from the backhand side or the forehand side. Novak loves those slow and high balls where he can sort of attack it and go really flat. So I really think that that's going to be a problem. Anyhow, I think in order for Ceci Pass to win, I think he needs to slice more in his backhand to change the rhythm. That's what Federer does really, really well against Djokovic, and Djokovic does find that uh, more difficult to attack because he's sort of looking to carry the speed of the ball and the ball is um, obviously not as fast from his slice so Djokovic can't sort of get as much of a rhythm and get power behind it so I really think that he needs to use his backhand slice as a changeup, and if he is going for winners to be as aggressive as possible because the longer the points uh, last the more of an advantage it is for Djokovic but overall, let's just hope that it's a good final and may the best man win. And in addition to all of this, um, to end it on a funny note, Ceci Pass actually posted Nick Kyrgios's number once on Instagram, and then Nick Kyrgios got his phone like completely blown up. And on Reddit, there's like a huge post about this about how Nick Kyrgios was like was like telling people on Instagram to like stop calling him because he's just getting so much like so many calls and so many texts. I don't know why he decided to post Kiros's phone number on Instagram, but yeah, his phone just like got completely blown up. But anyhow, that's uh, my review of the semifinal. I will be back in another six years after Nadal has won five more French Opens uh, for his next his fourth loss in in, in the French Open. And um, yeah, I mean, this is an important, I mean, a big moment in history. This is only his third loss in like 16 years in, in the French Open. So definitely a really, really rare occurrence. And congratulations to Novak and best of luck to the two players in the final. Okay, thank you everyone for listening to my review of the semi-final as well as my preview for the final of the French Open. That concludes this part of the weekly blog. I will be posting the full blog um, on Sunday, and I will be posting parts of each section of that weekly blog in the following weeks. So um, stay tuned for that. But yeah, thank you so much for um, watching this video, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.